I have to do all these voices and they're all gonna sound the same. Welcome to Forsaken by Shadows, a story by Sarah Danielle. Previously, on Forsaken by Shadows, from Tiana's point of view. Vrizman is an idiot. That's it. That's the summary. Okay, fine. I'm being a bit uncharitable, but it's hard not to get frustrated with him. Everything was going exactly as I hoped, and I thought, surely, this time, when he sees Mazira, he'll be so overcome with emotion the two of them will finally talk about their feelings. Their real feelings. Well, I was almost right. He was overcome with emotion. But unfortunately, Mazira wasn't alone. Valen got to her before we did, and rather than being mature about it, Rizman nearly loses his mind. He storms away, and I know a tantrum brewing when I see one. He's gonna go sulk, and I am not having it. He's ruining my festival! So despite his harsh attitude, I drag him somewhere private where we can talk, where I confront him once and for all about his feelings. I force him to admit what his problem is, and then I ask the question we've all been wondering. Why hasn't he told Mazir about his feelings? He tries to brush me off with some antiquated excuse about gender roles that we don't adhere to in Lana, and I force him to dig deeper, until we get to the wounds he's been guarding for so long. He doesn't tell me everything, but he tells me enough. Something has happened between them in the past that has scared him out of being forthcoming. And to make matters worse, he has a strange idea that Mazir might actually prefer Valen to himself. I mean, I guess she could, but I would be shocked. And I'd talk some sense into her too. Because Valen is not good for her. He's manipulative and demanding, and doesn't care about what she wants. Yet still, Rizmir insists that he can't confess, going so far as to claim he fears her rejection. Apparently, he doesn't think he's capable of loving anyone but Mazira. And I'm sorry, but that's just stupid, especially when you live as long as we elves do. So, I come up with an object lesson. A wild idea that just sprang into my mind unbidden. It's a stupid, reckless idea, but one that I can't let go of. I decide to prove that he is quite capable, at the very least, of noticing other girls, even if the emotion I stir up isn't as pure as love. But it's related, and it proves my point. I act like I'm going to kiss him. It's absolutely worth it just to see the look on his face. I don't think I've ever seen a drow so scared before. I can't help but tease him, flustered as I am, and he points out the real risk that he could have kissed me. But I already thought of that, and I decided it would have been just fine. Don't get me wrong. I like Rizmin, just not that much. But it would be nice, you know, to get that whole first kiss nonsense out of the way. And I trust him. It wouldn't be wasted if it proved my point. I don't expect anything to come of it, but somewhere in my babbling, his opinion must change. Because when I go to leave... He stops me, and we kiss. It's the most underwhelming and yet exhilarating experience. It's nothing like what the poets described, but still somehow special. And it will absolutely never happen again. But my lesson has been taught, and apologies are made, and we return to the festival, in search of Mazira, for what I hope will finally be the prelude to their first kiss. Forsaken by Shadows, Part 3, Where Shadows Linger, Chapter 30, Malachite, Draider. Nothing, no single thing, in all the world was as mentally taxing, physically frustrating, and emotionally annoying as a battle patrol wandering around without actually finding any battles. Seriously. Didn't this stretch of cavern know the Underdark had a reputation to uphold? The least it could do was send them a few cave crawlers or a dark mantle, 
or something killable. Mercenaries weren't supposed to get bored. They were supposed to be called in when there was actual work to be done. Or get kicked out of cities when they weren't wanted. But that was besides the point. A detail that definitely wasn't bothering Drader. Twelve hours after Lana's city gate had been slammed in his face. Nope. Not bothered one bit. He lounged on his back, his good hand folded under his head like a pillow while his hook nestled safely on his chest. His eyelids half shut as he did his best to ignore the bickering of his squadmates over what they were going to do next. An endeavor he might have succeeded in, for he was well versed in the art of tuning out stupidity. If it wasn't for the direct summons. Hey, princeling, came Golduck's voice, rising among the murmuring. The jeering nickname gave the forthcoming request away, as Goldux only called him princeling when in need of his princeling abilities. Drader lifted his head just enough to free his hand and snap his fingers at the exact moment Goldux said, Give us light. An orb of brilliant white light blossomed over their heads, followed by a chorus of angry hisses that was music to Drader's ears, bringing a satisfied smirk to his lips. Red light, princeling. Goldix growled. Give us red light. You didn't specify, Drader began, letting his own eyes open slowly to avoid the painful searing he'd just inflicted upon the others. How was I supposed to? Unholy Saldarin! He broke off with a gasp as his newly adjusted vision took in their surroundings. The once blue-toned limestone had been illuminated into a patchwork of bronze stone and green stains a natural mosaic of color and texture that had eluded his infravision. His gaze followed the design downward and he reached out to trace the mineral beside him, cool even beneath his gloved hand. Look at all this copper, he breathed, marveling at the sheer wonder of the deposit, though it wasn't the copper that excited him exactly. It was the malachite, the brilliant green crystal just begging to be mined. Goldix rolled his eyes, waving a flippant hand at Drader as if waving him away and unfolding a coded tunnel map, the study of which had probably inspired the request for light. Have you never seen a copper deposit before? The question came from Arden, who had settled near Drader, as he had every time they stopped for a rest, as if they were a merry pair of outcasts. His words, which had sounded curious rather than hostile, were some of the first he had spoken since they left the city. He'd been as stalwart in refusing conversation with the others as he had been with Drader. Though to be fair, the others hardly tried. I've seen them, Drader said, scrambling to his feet. He summoned a second orb of white light, bringing it near the wall as he scrutinized the stone. There's just so much of it, and this stone is unworked. The tunnels around Lana are pretty rich in it, Arden said the shrug audible in his voice. Our active minds are in the southeast. And just like that, Drader's excitement crumbled. He muttered a curse before remembering he wasn't supposed to say those words anymore. How was he supposed to impress Tiana with common crystals? She'd hardly be impressed with bare minimum minerals, and he'd insult himself by trying. No, he needed something else. Something more suited to his intentions as her suitor. Something worthy of her resplendent smile. Taking a step back, Drader raised the orb higher, searching the limestone for one of Copper's less common companions, such as the multicolored Bornite or the deep red Copperite. Yet as far as he could see, there was nothing else. Just great swaths of an interesting green. Wrinkling his nose, as though the wall had personally disappointed him by its boring existence, he drifted down the tunnel, taking his second orb of light with him. Where are you going? Arden asked, sounding concerned. Drader gritted his teeth. Nowhere? But every eye was on him now, suspicion and ridicule traced in their features. Great. Did the Gloam Drow not understand the meaning of minding his own business? Or at the very least, keeping his voice down? Just going to see what's around. Drader added, affecting innocence. Since we're not in a hurry. Actually, we've just come to a decision, Goldix said, rolling up the map. We're taking... But Drader stopped listening, 
his attention returning to the limestone wall. No, they were moving out? Now? When the tunnels finally got interesting? This opportunity was too good to waste. He edged further away, hoping against hope for a splash of color that wasn't green. Tiglath, Nyman called, rising to his feet. Then he paused, a smirk creeping over his lips. Is this about the girl? Girl, Arden repeated. At the same moment, Drader hastily said, no. But the smiles were starting, cruel joy feasting at his expense. It's definitely about the girl, said Kelzaar, their axe-wielding warrior. Wow, Tiglith, you've got it bad. Shut up, Drader grumbled, but to his chagrin, a blush crept up his neck and into his cheeks, and bathed in the rays of his blinding white light, they would all be able to see it. What girl? Arden asked, looking between them. Oh, he hasn't told you, Nyman said. The real pretty one, with the silver eyes. What's her name? The priest's daughter. Don't, Drader began, but it was too late. Her beautiful name was already forming on Arden's lips. Tiana? He sounded incredulous, the way Riz had sounded when Drader had first revealed his intentions. Scat. Tiana, Kelzaar said, clapping his hands together. So that's her name. See, Drader, was that so hard? Tiana, Nyman mused. She is fetching, I'll give you that, kid. Maybe we ought to all bring her some crystals. Let her choose real men from among the boys. The squad laughed, a chorus of scornful noise, and even though Drader knew, he knew Nyman wasn't serious, his fist still clenched and his jaw ached from grinding his teeth. I would advise against that, Arden said, his soft voice taking on a measure of steel reminiscent of his father's. Her family can be rather... protective. Tell that to your friend there, said Nyman. He's the one who's been sneaking off to see her every hour. Why do you think he was late this morning? Zabed added. Off to peek at her window again, Kelzaar accused. Our own little stalker, Nyman concluded, his sarcasm barbed with malice giving us well-behaved men bad reputations everywhere we go. Arden was staring at Drader as if seeing him for the first time, a look of fury etched into his features. Drader let his own fury roll off him in waves. He let loose a string of foul suggestions of activities Nyman and the rest of his squad could participate in, thoroughly violating his self-imposed ban on profanity in the process. It only made them laugh louder. Turning away in disgust, Drader resumed his study of the wall. He didn't owe any of them, especially Arden, an explanation. True, had they been in Menzo Baron's Inn, and had Nyman been shouting his accusations in the streets, he might have had cause to be concerned. The crimes they called out were capital offenses, and thorough investigation wasn't something most matrons had time for. But none of it was true and the only person who needed to be aware of how proper and respectful his behavior toward Tiana had been was Tiana herself. The others could go... participate in crude activities. Come on, Tigloth, Goldix called, his tone cajoling as he stowed the map back in his pack. We're just messing with you. Let's move out. Drader replied with a rude hand gesture. I'll catch up. That silenced them all, and Drader resisted the urge to smirk. After a moment, Goldick said, You're wasting your time. Your girl isn't even going to understand the significance of what you're trying to do. They breed them differently out here. Breed? Arden growled, but as usual, he was completely ignored. She might, Drader insisted, though deep down he suspected Goldix was right. Tiana's world was so different from his own. How could she know that where he came from, showing preference for a woman could get him whipped? How could she understand the lengths that men would go to in order to make their audacity so impressive, the woman they developed an attachment to would let it slide, and maybe even return their favor, 
if they were impressed enough. She probably couldn't, because her world was safe. She didn't understand how dangerous it was to leave the city alone in search of precious stones. She couldn't understand what it could cost a man to expose his belly to a woman who might just take the jewels along with his entrails. That sort of behavior didn't seem to be tolerated in Lana. But that didn't mean Drader wasn't going to try. Fine, Goldick spat. You don't want to come, you don't have to. But don't come crying after us when the cave crawlers get you. What cave crawlers? Drader retorted. There isn't anything out here. I'll catch up in a minute. There was some murmured debate amongst themselves. Then Goldux gave the command, and the squad rose. Arden alone stood still, looking from Drader to the rest. You are serious, the Glomdrow finally said, his previous hatred replaced by surprise. You are really going to just abandon him? Well, we're not going to wait around while he chases a fantasy, Goldix shot back. You coming, Tagalong? But it's dangerous, Arden said, still seeming in shock. At the very least, we know there are drow out here. Killers. You are looking at them, Sarek muttered. But... Look, Goldix said. The kid made his choice. It's a stupid choice, but it's his. I'm not wasting my energy trying to educate him. If it means that much to you, then you can stay behind and babysit him. Drader didn't wait for their bickering to finish, moving on down the tunnel in the direction from which they had come. His eyes adhered to the mineral veins. Whatever they decided didn't matter to him. He was on his own mission now. Smothering silence enveloped him as his squad finally moved on, their footsteps perfectly impossible to detect and Drader relaxed. Finally, peace. Something the Underdark wasn't supposed to be known for, but he found comforting all the same. At least in Menzo Berenson he could escape his teammates in between missions, or take on solo work. This Lana job was starting to wear him down, with their limited boundaries of where they were allowed to roam. He was going to enjoy this isolation while it lasted. Or... So he thought. A whisper of fabric rustled just behind his back, and Drader's hand found the hilt of his sword before his brain could fully comprehend the alarm bells going off in his head, drawing the weapon and spinning around. Arden froze, his hands raised in a gesture of surrender. Really? He looked underwhelmed. What the? What are you still doing here? Babysitting, apparently. He hoisted his pack over one shoulder and trudged toward him. I may not like you, but I won't be able to live with myself if something eats you. Drader snorted, turning back to his scrutiny of the wall. Well, that's stupid. Anything strong enough to eat me will have no problems washing my corpse down with you. There's safety in numbers, Arden said, either ignoring the jab at his skills or missing it completely. Which is why I expected you to go running off with the rest. Like I said, Arden grumbled, wouldn't be able to live with myself. Drader glanced at him, lips pursed, hackles raised, not believing Arden for a second. No one just took risks for the sake of resting easier, and especially not for their enemies. That was how lifespans got quartered. Look, if you're just waiting around for the opportunity to stab me in the back, let's just get it over with. Drader twirled his blade in a pointless, yet artful display. I've been itching to know what skills your father passed on to you anyway. Arden's frown became a dark mask of disdain, and Drader braced himself, ready for the attempted murder that was so clearly written on Arden's face. Yet rather than draw his own weapons, the Glomdrow crossed his arms. Nothing. Come again? I learned nothing from my father, Arden said, his bleak tone sharper than Drader's blade. He was too busy teaching brats like you. Now could you just finish up whatever game you're playing? We need to follow the others before they get too far ahead. Your stupidity is risking all our lives. Drader gaped at him as he brushed by. What are you looking for anyway? Arden asked, now officially saying more words than Drader had ever heard from him before. I'll help if it speeds this up. 
He might as well have been speaking in a foreign language. This had to be a trap. Some elaborate prank to lure him in with trust before gutting him like a fish. Perhaps the Gloamdrow didn't think he could win an open, honest combat, so he devised a not-so-clever scheme. Whatever his reasons, Drader snapped his jaw shut and returned to the scrutiny of the wall, keeping a wary watch on Arden out of the corner of his eye. Anything but Malachite, Drader answered. Bornite would be ideal, but I'll settle for Azurite or Turquoise. Arden stiffened. So it's true, then? What they said about you and Tiana? Despite the impending threat looming in his words, Drader's heart skipped a beat. Arden understood the connection between crystal hunting and girl hunting, which meant he understood the significance, and if he understood, then maybe Tiana would too. His pulse increased as he pictured the smile he was sure to receive when he presented her with an ocean blue azurite pendant, or maybe a clip for her hair. Girls like that sort of thing, right? Why had he never paid more attention to what girls liked? Oh, right because he was focusing on surviving his education. Well, Arden demanded, drawing Drader back to the question at hand. What were they talking about again? Right, him and Tiana. Which part? he asked, continuing down the tunnel. This copper deposit was massive. The part about you stalking her. Drader laughed. Yeah, right. I'm not stupid. That's how you get your eyes gouged out. And worse, but some maimings didn't need to be mentioned. Then why would they say it? What, you never been hazed by your squad before? No. Drader hesitated, once more taking his eyes from the copper vein to study the gloam drow. If he was a liar, he was one of the best Drader had ever met. His simple, single syllable carried no bluster, no pride, nor even contempt. Drader had asked him a question, and the answer to the question had been no. Lana was such a weird place. Oh, well, Drader shrugged. You're missing out on a good time. They treat you so terribly. Drader withheld an exasperated sigh. Had Arden missed his obvious sarcasm, or did he just really enjoy pointing out the obvious? Yeah, well, scat happens. Scott? The gloom drow wrinkled his nose. Don't you mean... No, Drader snapped, cutting him off with perhaps a little more force than necessary. He couldn't quite help himself, though. It was bad enough he had to change his entire vocabulary. Did he have to be called out on it, too? I don't. When Arden just looked at him, Drader tossed up his hand. I'm watching my tongue, he explained even though Arden didn't deserve an explanation. Riz says Tiana doesn't like coarse language. So you are stalking her. No, I'm courting her affection, Drader said with a roll of his eyes. They really did breed their drow differently out here. Respectably. You can ask Riz if you don't believe me. Then, under his breath, he added, Why does everyone assume I'm a stalker? Gee, I dunno, Arden replied though Drader had meant it as a rhetorical question. Maybe it's where you come from, or the company you keep, or the profession you've chosen. They rounded a bend and found themselves in a wider chamber, a small forest of stalagmites clawing for the ceiling while their stalactite brethren reached down to meet them. A few of the pairs had already collided, forming hourglass columns. A narrow crevice cut through the center, and loose chunks of stone littered the cavern floor. They'd passed through here before, and Drader hadn't cared much for the scenery then. Just generic blue tones typical of any normal cave. Now it was a treasure trove of potential. Drader dropped to his knees, sifting through the stone even as he continued his argument with the tagalong. You know, you sanctuary folk sure do think highly of yourselves for people who claim to be all about love and tolerance, when you don't actually live it out. What's that supposed to mean? It means I keep hearing about how great and wonderful and kind and accepting your goddess and community are, Drader said, lifting a stone to his light. A thrill coursed through him at the sight of a deep blue stain. Jackpot. He tucked it into his pouch and searched for another. But when it comes to celebrating her, 
You kick us out to do your dirty work. So what? She takes everyone but the mercenaries? That's not... You aren't... But he fell silent, just as he had when Drader had pointed out that his fairy friend had no business on a drow hunt. Proof that Drader was right once more. Yet after another false start, Arden finally ground out, If you don't want to be treated like miscreants, then don't act like miscreants. Drader barked a wry laugh. Now there's a novel idea, he muttered, rising to his feet. There were more stones on the other side of the crevice. I mean it, Arden insisted, tailing him. I've watched you all. I see how you treat each other, how you treat me. The elves who came to Lana came here to escape that. What Davian said at the gate was out of line, I'll admit that. But you have to admit that you all haven't exactly made your company appealing. If Drader happened to care about Arden's opinion of his behavior, he might have been offended. He might have felt the need to point out that he was, in general, behaving as a model citizen, usually only escaping Doc Road when Riz or Salarin escorted him and generally leaving Tiana alone unless she spoke to him first, as a proper suitor should. Arden's accusations were as unfounded as his squad mates, but Drader didn't care, so he moved along hopping over the narrow crevice to the side of the chamber. Yet when his feet hit the ground, he froze. What? What was that? He spun, bringing his lights over the crevice and staring down into what should have been a too narrow to matter crack in the ground. His heart stopped. Hey, Zarin, he called, his voice barely above a whisper in his shock. You bicker and fight, Arden went on apparently not catching on to the shift in Drader's mood and attention. You repay kindness with insult. Zarin, Drader said again, more insistently, his eyes riveted on the bottom of the crevice. We do accept people of every background, but those people want a different lifestyle. They want Arden, Drader hissed, and finally the gloom drow shut up, glaring at him. Drader jabbed his hook toward the crevice. Is that your father? Arden went very, very still, the color draining from his face. If this is a joke, Drader scowled. No, it's not a joke, he said, gesturing again to the crumpled heap of a drow who lay at the bottom of the shallow crevice. He'd like to say with confidence that the elf was indeed Torafane Zarin, but he only resembled the ghost of him. Gaunt and pale, with his hair shorn close to his scalp, and besides, it had been over a year since Drader had last seen his old teacher. Slowly, far more slowly than Drader felt the situation called for, Arden approached the crevice. When he finally looked down, he sucked in a sharp breath. Duh, he said, before leaping down after his broken wreck of a father without even assessing if the situation was safe first. Drader just watched him, hand on his hilt, as he ran calculations through his head. Hadn't they come through this cavern on their way in? Hadn't they all skipped over this exact same crevice without anyone noticing what lay at the bottom? That didn't bode well for the condition of his old teacher. If he wasn't producing enough body heat to make him stand out against the cold stone, he was probably a goner. How close they had come to not finding him at all! How many other patrols had walked right past him? Arden was nearly too broad to get his father but he somehow managed to wedge himself down before him. Duh, he groaned again, putting a hand on the older elf's shoulder. Duh, please. His voice broke on the words, and Drader had the sudden sensation that he was an intruder in a bizarre scenario. The affection between parents and children was still a relatively new concept to him, and he'd only witnessed it thus far in the bond between Tiana and her father, which had been mostly manifested as doting and adoring. Seeing Arden this way, hearing the break in his voice, felt wrong. Like he shouldn't be here. Like his presence stained the moment somehow. Like Arden should be alone too. What, mourn? Was that what was happening before him? And yet, as Arden shook Torafane slightly, the old corpse warmed over. His eyes shooting open, his hands swiping at Arden as if he was an enemy. Drader jumped, 
startled as one of his favorite swears escaped his lips before he could catch it. Arden dodged the swiping hand and caught his father's wrist. Da, it's me, Arden. We've got you. You're safe now. If Drader had been down in that crack, with Torafane's wild gaze fixed on him like that, he'd be backing up right now. The emaciated warrior looked rabid. But Arden leaned in, wrapping his arms around Torafane's frail frame. We've got you. It's all right. It's me. For a moment, Torfin looked like he was going to snap his son's neck, his breath coming ragged and heavy. But then he relaxed, sagging against the stone wall. Arden, he croaked. Arden leaned back, his broad smile transforming his character entirely. That's right, it's me. Can you walk? We're a little ways from Lana, but we'll get you there. Torfane frowned, his eyes narrowing as he glanced around, before they landed on Drader. His brow furrowed deeper. Tigleth. He looked again to Arden. Is this real? Arden laughed, and the sound suited him, like he was made to laugh, not brood. It's a long story. You've missed a lot. Come on, get up. We need to move. Wait. Torfane said, gripping the sleeve of his arm. Tell me a lie. A lie? Drader cocked an eyebrow. Seriously, Da? The younger Zarin sounded exasperated. When his father just stared at him with that impenetrable mask Drader had come to know so well, Arden sighed. Fine. I was happy to see you when I got home. The look of sheer relief that washed over Torfane's face was all wrong. He clasped Arden's shoulder, his glacial expression melting into more emotion than Drader thought the warrior capable of feeling. My son, he said, and with it came the return of that weird feeling that Drader ought not be here. What happened, Da? Arden asked. You look like you've been tortured. And Miss Krizla, is she... is she... Later, was all Torfane said. I need... Healing. Arden nodded. Give me a hand, Drader, he said, as he helped Horophane to stand. The father leaned heavily on his son, as though he lacked the strength to hold up what little weight remained on his frame. Really? Give me a hand? Drader scoffed and crossed his arms. Can't, he said. I don't have a spare hand to give. You know what I mean, Arden snapped. But Drader was already moving, clambering down beside him to take up Torfane's other arm, because yes, he knew what he had meant, and yes, he could appreciate that this was going to require his help. Yeah, well, you don't have to be so insensitive about it. Seriously? Arden glanced askance at him. That's what you're choosing to take offense to? They hoisted Torfane between them, and Drader wrinkled his nose. He didn't just look like a corpse. He smelled like one, too. Definitely not a good sign. Can you levitate Tagalong? Yeah, Arden said, surprising Drader by not arguing. Without any further coordination, they kicked off the ground, their magic catching them before gravity could. They drifted upward and settled on the side of the chamber where Drader had been hoping to scrounge up some more azurite. We should get the others, Arden said. Do you have some way to communicate with them? No, said Drader, with a scornful laugh. He tapped the rune he wore around his neck. Only works one way, and I'm at the bottom of the barrel. One of us will have to run then, Arden said, then swore. The cavern fork's up ahead. Do you remember which fork they were planning to take? We don't have time to be wrong. Drader merely shrugged. I wasn't listening. Seriously? That seemed to be a favorite word of his. What? Drader said, defensive. I didn't know there was a fork and I was busy. You obviously weren't or you wouldn't be asking me. I was distracted by your impudence. Boys, Torfane growled, and Drader jumped. He'd almost forgotten the warrior was still alive, let alone conscious. Squabble on your own time. We need to get back to Lana. Immediately. Lives depend on it. 
For an elf who couldn't support his own frame without assistance, he sure could command a cavern. Drader and Arden exchanged brief glances over his head, then set off at once, half dragging, half carrying the sickly warrior back toward the city. Drader let his dancing lights wink out, plunging them into darkness as they left the copper chamber behind. He'd only snagged one chunk of azurite, but that concern had dropped to the bottom rung of his list. They didn't speak again, they just trudged on, through tunnel after tunnel, until at length, the welcome sound of the thunderous waterfall rose over their steady breathing. Up ahead, a rosy glow painted the tunnel wall a dull red, enough to flicker their vision into the natural spectrum, as if tendrils of the Lawnite Cavern had reached out to greet them. Finally, Drader muttered. Just one more bend and then they'd see the city. Torophane must have sensed it as well. His whole body suddenly tensed. Then he was moving, scrambling, disentangling himself from their support and shuffling forward, as if the taste of home had awoken a fervent hunger in his soul. Da! Arden called, as his father surged ahead. Torophane didn't make it far before he tripped, sprawling face first on the stone. Arden rushed to him, but Drader looked away, ashamed to see the elf he'd admired so greatly fall from such heights. This was the elf he'd been plotting his revenge against for over a year? He wasn't convinced the gods hadn't beat him to it. It wasn't enough to just look away. Drader turned his whole back, and that single act of disappointment was probably the only thing that saved his life. Drader barely had time to make sense of the black-bladed sword cleaving straight for his face. There was no time to draw his own weapon, no time to shout, no time to duck or roll out of the way. All Drader could do was raise his right hand to block the downward descent of the weapon. His right hand, which happened to be made of the highest quality of drow-crafted adamantium his coffers could afford. And even in his exile, his coffers ran deep. The clang and shower of sparks was enough to alert Arden to the danger, as evidenced by his swearing, while Drader braced his hook with his good hand, grunting from the effort of holding back the black sword of Talorial Tear. Talorial, bloody, tear. Son of a matron. He should have known. I remember you, Talorial said offering him the barest hint of a smile, the boy from the bar. He reared back and Drader took the opportunity to wrench his own blade from its scabbard, just in time to parry the next attack. But his footing was all wrong, and he nearly lost his balance. The boy who lost his hand to my little brother. This was bad. This was really, really bad. They shouldn't have traveled without their whole squad. They should have taken the time to fetch them. Drader wasn't stupid. He was an excellent swordsman. But Taloriel was a legend. The outcast from House Tigleth, Taloriel concluded, his sword swiping with each statement. Drader gave more ground with each attack, barely defending the blood in his veins. He was vaguely aware of Arden and Torfane at his back was fairly certain he'd heard weapons drawn somewhere between the ringing of steel on steel. But it did him little good. The tunnel was too narrow to make room for an ally. And then, Taloriel stopped. One moment, he'd been stabbing relentlessly. The next, he hesitated, staying in the ready position, but no longer advancing. Drader took two more steps back, finally able to adopt a proper stance. Taloriel smiled, like he found him adorable. We all heard you were a disappointment, he said. But did you have to be a traitor, too? Drader narrowed his eyes. Melee Magthair didn't teach them to talk through their fights, and they certainly didn't teach them not to press the advantage while they had it. So what was Taloriel doing? Taunting him? Playing with him? Who the hell are you? Came Arden's growl, from somewhere just over Drader's shoulder. Oh? Does my reputation not precede me? 
His eyes flicked from Drader to Arden and back. Would you like to handle the introductions, or should I? Something wasn't right. He was talking entirely too much. His reputation did precede him, and from what little Drader knew of the infamous eldest son of House Tyr, this kind of chatter didn't suit him. Granted, he'd never met the elf personally, only stood in a class while he presented, and to think, back then he wanted to grow up to be just like him. Funny how priorities changed, though he wouldn't mind dipping into that same level of notoriety and skill, and maybe fearsome, ah, focus, Drader. He dared to glance over his shoulder, assessing what was behind him. Arden stood close, weapons drawn as he'd suspected. Torfane had managed to pull himself to his feet, but he leaned heavily against a wall, and his breathing was already labored. Gods, they were so close. So close to getting him back to Lana, to earning himself a nice fat reward and the admiration of Tiana, to... Wait a moment. That was it. You must have missed my handiwork on the bodies we left in the river, Teloriel said, his attention now fixed on Arden. But I'm sure you can admire what I've done to your... father, I presume? His lips curled in disgust over the word. And of course, it worked. Arden cried out in wordless fury, attempting to shove past Drader to get to Teloriel, but Drader was onto the game now. His hook snaked around Arden's rising arm, and he yanked the Gloamdrow back with enough force to pierce the sleeve of his adamantium armor and send him staggering back. Take your father and get out of here, Drader hissed, when Arden turned his big, innocent, fairy drow eyes on him, betrayal written all over his features. What? Get Torafane and go! I'm not running like a coward! Oh, for the love of... Drader shook his head. Look, if you want to make his day, by all means, run in like an idiot so he can mince you up. But if you really want to piss off the elf who tortured your father, you'll hightail it around the corner and throw the biggest goddamn tantrum you can and maybe get some of the Law Knights off the wall to reinforce us. An ugly look overtook Teloriel's face, confirming Drader's suspicions. Teloriel wasn't taunting them for fun. He just didn't want to get too close to the source of light behind them, as he rightfully assumed it came from a civilization. He'd probably stalked them the entire way here, waiting for them to show him the way to Lana, making a gamble of when close enough would become too close. And now that they had reached the turning point, the last thing he wanted was for Torafane to take back whatever knowledge of his plans he possessed. It's what Drader would have done, at least. Realization dawned on Arden's face as he glanced from their enemy to the red light painting the wall behind them. But you... you'll be alone. Please, Drader said, sneering for good measure. Haven't you heard? I'm a god's damn prodigy. He twirled his sword for good measure, though it was all for show. There was no reality in which he survived a one-on-one -on -one duel with Teloriel. He just had to survive long enough for Arden to get reinforcements. And that, he was fairly certain he could do. Probably. Maybe. If we both run, he'll overtake us, Drader murmured. One of us has to stay and keep him busy. So get going, and don't you dare abandon me out here, or I swear to both Seldarines I will haunt you for eternity. Arden hesitated for one precious heartbeat, looking torn before he spun on his heel and rushed back toward the city. Teloriel cursed and drew a throwing knife, hurling it past Drader's head. Drader tried to knock it aside, but his reflexes weren't quite that well-tuned, and the knife landed with a sickening thud and a cry of pain. There was no point looking to see who it hit, nor what their condition was. He just had to hope that one of them made it and did their job, which left Drader to hold up his end of the plan. He surged forward, slashing at Teloriel with his blade to prevent him from getting off another throwing knife, and of course, Teloriel deflected his attack easily, drawing his second sword. Aren't you a clever little boy, he hissed, as the flurry of slashes began. He was so fast! Drader parried what he could, dodged what he couldn't, 
and found tiny scratches materializing up his arms and across his chest, as though his adamantium armor was made of ordinary silk. He just had to survive until help arrived. Just had to survive. Pain burned across his side as he misread a feint, earning him his first deeper wound. Not quite serious, but definitely concerning. Drader winced, pulling back instinctively, until L'Oreal made to dart around him. No way, not on his watch. Drader spun, and just as he had with Arden, he lashed out with his hook, but where with Arden, he'd intended to catch, not wound. With Teloriel, he didn't care. The tip of his hook dug into the warrior's shoulder, stopping his forward momentum, and Drader jerked him back, thrusting for his stomach as he did so. Teloriel growled and managed to pivot out of the way of his stab. From over his shoulder, Drader just made out Arden's form limping out of view. Curse it all, they'd only made it that far? He must have taken the throwing knife, and it affected his movement. But that was all Drader had time to conclude before he was back on the defensive, and this time, the ground he gave was away from the city. I was going to let you live, Teloriel snarled, as blood dribbled from the puncture wound Drader had left on him. I liked you, boy. And unlike my sister, I appreciate you're just here to get paid. He dropped his second sword and brought his black blade cleaving down once more with both hands, and the shock of blocking it sent stinging pain up Drader's sword arm. You're not wrong, Drader said through clenched teeth, as Teloriel bore his weight down on the blade. Not personal, just professional. That's too bad. Teloriel said, arching back for another downward cleave. Drader raised his sword again, prepared for the block, but at the last second, Teloriel changed direction, his sword slithering around Drader's defenses and right into his middle. Everything went very still and very cold. Drader coughed, tasting iron. He didn't so much feel the sharpness of the blade in his gut as he felt the impact of the force. He staggered back, intellectually understanding that he should probably start running away, but his body wouldn't move. Fingers closed around his throat, and he was smashed against the stone wall, with Teloriel's vicious smile looming in front of him. Take a message to my kitty for me, he said, raising a knife to the side of his face. Let her know I'm coming to collect her. He dragged the knife down the side of Drader's face, and all Drader could think was, so that's how Ray's got his scar. His vision swam in and out of focus, as he desperately willed his hooked hand to move, to rise up and defend him just like he'd practiced. What was the point of always having a weapon if the weapon was useless to him? Why wasn't his arm obeying? Well, if the hook wasn't working, maybe his hand would come through for him. It seemed to have lost its grasp on his sword, but he had other weapons. Drader patted around his belt for something, anything, and felt a smile creep onto his face as his hand closed around his hand crossbow. At this range, he couldn't miss, and he always kept it drawn and loaded. The way Teloriel's eyes widened when the dart pierced through his belly was immensely satisfying. He stumbled backward, and Drader slumped to the cavern floor continuing to grin at him. He wondered, idly, what would happen first. Would he bleed out, or would the sleep toxin take its toll on Teloriel? Teloriel didn't seem inclined to want to find out. He removed his hand from the wound, saw the red that coated it, turned, and fled. The bloody coward. Blackness took Drader. A soft, warm swoon that was rudely interrupted by shouting. So much shouting, so many voices. Then he was being jostled, and pain exploded in his abdomen. Was this how Riz's girl had felt when Gylas had stabbed her? It had been Drader's fault that happened. He'd started the game. Wait, why did he care? Why did that thought cross his mind? Ugh. And why were there so many voices? He just wanted to sleep. Finally, he was laid down, 
Not necessarily on something soft, but at least something flat. The last thing he heard before succumbing to the blackness once more was a stern voice shouting, Someone go find a priestess! Thank you for listening to this episode of Forsaken by Shadows, written and produced by me, Sarah Danielle. And thank you to Tabletop Audio and Pixabay for the use of their work in this production. As always, Forsaken by Shadows is unofficial fan content not endorsed by Wizards of the Coast. Once again, I find myself without really any closing commentary. It is what it is, and that all just happened. You're just going to have to wait and follow along to find out what happens next. Whoa! Whew, my blanket fort just about fell on my face. A detail that definitely wasn't bothering him. Have I actually said Drader's name yet? Cool, even beneath his gloved hands. <laughs> Whoops. Cool, even beneath his gloved hand.